Well, good morning and welcome. I have some great, long-anticipated news today. I know we've been waiting two months, but finally, I have received a haircut. You can look at it. My wife did it. She did a fabulous job. Um, well, without any further whatever, let's stand and let's sing together. My God is merciful and mighty I have forgiveness by His blood And even though my sins are many My God remembers them no more Jesus, the Holy Son of David you are the way, the truth, the life. You knew no sin, but you became it. And by the cross I'm justified. Oh, I'm a child of the one true King. My only hope is Christ in me. This is this song my heart will sing. Oh, I, I am found in you. Oh, 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 oh. My life alone is for your glory. One stand, but now. Alive in you, your resurrection is my story. Oh, my faith, I stand up. I'm a child of the one true King. My only hope is Christ in me. This is this song my heart will sing Oh, I am found in you My past cannot pursue me My sins are washed away Your goodness and your mercy Will follow all my deeds My past cannot pursue me My sins are washed away your goodness and your mercy will follow all my deeds. My past cannot pursue me. My sins are washed away. Your goodness and your mercy will follow all my deeds. My past cannot pursue me. My sins are washed away. Your goodness and your mercy will follow all my days, oh my days, I'm a child of the one true King, my only hope is Christ in me, this is his song, my heart will sing, oh I am found in you. child of the one true King. My only hope is Christ in me. This is the song my heart will sing. Good morning, everyone. As we begin our worship this morning, I'd like to share a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you 
who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I know many of us find ourselves tested by various trials throughout this pandemic, but praise God that we have hope in the resurrection of Christ and that we have an inheritance that is imperishable. So let's hold that in our hearts as we continue our worship this morning.
For joining us online today. It is really good to be with you. Why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles and we're going to get ready to read scripture. Before we do that, I have one quick announcement and that is the staff meets on Wednesdays and we long to know the ways that we can be praying for you and your family. So if you have any prayer requests, send us an email at connect at gracechurchinfo.net. Thanks. Paul will be continuing the base camp series this morning in the book of Romans. So we will be reading Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 15. Again, that's Romans 10, 9 through 15. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, Father, we thank you so much for the gift of this day and for your mercy and grace that it represents. We thank you also for the gift of our uh, incredible teaching pastors, and we thank you for their passion and energy for your word and for preparations of their messages. We pray that you would bless the work of Paul's hands now and marry it to your spirit. We pray, Father, that you would draw our hearts to you, that you would keep our minds from distraction, and that you um, would teach us from your word this morning and draw us closer to you as a result. Father, we pray all of these things in your name and for your glory. Amen.
Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, last week, I was talking with a pastor who serves overseas in a, an area that is predominantly Muslim, and he was telling me that a little while back, he had a young man uh, come and start getting involved at his church. And the father of this young man, when, when he heard about this, was extremely upset. And uh, very angrily, he came to the pastor's house and confronted him and uh, told him that he didn't want his son to be involved and that if the pastor continued to allow the son to be involved, uh, he made some very serious uh, threats, uh, not only against the pastor himself, but his family as well. It was uh, very distressing. Well, then a few months later, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, this man, the father, lost his job and he became very desperate. And can you guess where the first place was that he came to ask for help? The man uh, humbly came to the door of this pastor and knocked and asked if the church could provide some assistance for him. And the pastor was able to help this father and uh, they became friends. It's just uh, one of those small examples of how the Lord sometimes uses the desperate circumstances that we find ourselves in life to, to humble us and to soften us and, and, and sometimes even to cause us to look to him. And this doesn't happen all the time, but it does sometimes happen. And we together really need to pray that the Lord would use this current crisis that we find ourselves in to produce this sort of humility and softening in our country too. Uh, unfortunately, when, when we turn on the news, it, it doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, our country seems to be more divided and angry than ever before, at least as angry and divided as I can remember it being. However, I have to say from my own perspective, I, I do see this sense of humility and, and softness uh, at play in our community. I have seen it in the people of our church in the loving and gracious and helpful ways that our community here has responded and cared for one another. And I even feel it in my own neighborhood. When I go out for walks and, and speak with people, I've, I've noticed how warm and eager to talk people are. There, there seems to be within my community a, a, a sense of kindness and camaraderie with one another. And, a feeling that we are really all in this together. I think people are, are just seeking to really find together some hope and some good news in these difficult times. Well, what we need to pray is that people would look to God for this hope and good news because hope and good news is absolutely God's specialty. Uh, the gospel is by definition good news. That's exactly what the word gospel means. And if you want to understand what the good news is that God offers, it's, it's spelled out so clearly in one verse, a verse that was just read for us, Romans 10, verse 9. And Paul writes, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, to be saved means to be rescued from danger. Uh, it, it's a life preserver, being thrown to somebody who's drowning. Uh, it's a, a ladder that's extended to the fifth story window of a, of a burning apartment building. It's an injection of anti-venom into the nervous system of somebody who's been bitten by a snake. Whatever the danger is, the act of saving overcomes that danger and secures the safety of that person. And so in a competition, being saved from danger is always more powerful than the danger itself. And just like scissors beats paper, 
and rock beats scissors, being saved always beats whatever the danger is that a person happens to be in. Now, the, the work of saving that's described in this passage is the greatest, most powerful, uh, in the words of, of Mary Poppins' most supercalifragilistic expialidocious saving work of all time. The ultimate saving work is God's rescue of a human soul. And God's saving work provides for a person to be completely forgiven from their sins. But not only that, to be adopted as God's children and to be the recipient of the full extent with nothing held back of his love for all of time. And we know that this is made possible for us only by the extraordinary sacrifice of God sending Jesus for us. And when we trust in Christ, the Bible tells us a thousand times over in a thousand different ways, when we trust in him, God saves us. Listen, if you are a Christian this morning, if you've done this, if you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might still catch the virus. You might still lose your job. You might have any number of terrible things that happen to you in your life, but the promise is that because you've been saved, things are going to turn out okay. In fact, things are going to turn out more than just okay. Everything is going to be more than fine in the end. Because God has pledged right here that you will be saved from all danger. And what that means is that in the words of the Apostle Paul, that you may be afflicted, but you will never be crushed. You may become perplexed, but you do not need to despair. You may be persecuted, but you'll never be abandoned. And even if you are struck down, you will never be destroyed. That is what God's salvation provides for us. And, and what we want to consider today is that this gift, this incredible gift that we've been granted by the mercy of God is not something that is just to be treasured and, and hidden away in our hearts. It's meant to be given away to other people. And, and just as it's a joy and not a burden to be the one that throws that life preserver to someone who's drowning or to be the one that gets to extend that ladder into the fifth story blazing building or, or, or to be the one that, that saves a life by injecting antivenom into a, a, a dying victim, so too it is meant to be our joy, our delight to share this saving hope with other people. Today we want to think about how God is a sender. He sent Jesus into the world to save us. And now what he does, in turn, is he sends us into the world to tell other people that Jesus can save them too. We carry this good news, just as it says right here in verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, uh, as God's messengers carry his message, what Paul does in this passage is he describes a series of steps that have to unfold for a person who has never heard or experienced or understood the gospel to be saved. And what he does is, I think very creatively, he illustrates this four-step process with four rhetorical questions. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time uh, looking at these four questions this morning, and they're found beginning in verse 14. Paul writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, 
How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Well, uh, let's take a look at Paul's first question. He, he says, how will they call on him who they have not believed? Now, uh, this statement is uh, pretty obvious on the surface, uh, but it does have tremendous implications for a person who is not a believer. What he's saying is that the only reason that they would call on Jesus to save them would be if they really believed that that was something that God had the power and the ability and the desire to do. He's saying if they don't believe that the gospel is true or that it's offered to them or that they, they need it, then they will never call on Jesus. If they don't think that they need the gospel because they're good enough as they are, they will never call on Jesus. On the other hand, if they feel that they're too guilty or dirty or unlovable to ever receive the gospel, then they'll never call on Jesus either. But if a person comes to understand that salvation is a gift from God that is not based on any work that they could do, so that nobody is so good that they don't need it offered to them by the grace of God. And nobody is so bad that they are disqualified from receiving it, but instead that God offers his saving grace freely and joyfully to any sinner who would receive it. Then this tells us that when a person comes to believe this, they can call on the Lord to accept it. But what he's saying is that nobody is going to call on the Lord for a gift that they don't believe that they need or don't think that they could possibly have. And so our job is simply to help them, first of all, to see that they need to be saved. And second of all, that if they want to be saved, that they can be. That God has the, the power and desire to do that. And that includes absolutely anyone with no exceptions. Your next door neighbor might be the loudest, meanest, raunchiest, worst neighbor in the entire world. He might have stolen your lawnmower on purpose and disassembled it and, and then buried all the pieces of it scattered throughout your lawn in different places. The guy is a real jerk but God can save him because the gospel is more powerful than his sin. And if by the power of the Holy Spirit working in his life, that neighbor comes to believe that Jesus Christ died for him and rose for him. And if he calls on the Lord in genuine faith, even he, the worst neighbor in the history of all neighbors, can be saved from his sin. Anyone can be saved. It doesn't matter how far from God that person appears to be. And the Bible gives us so many examples of this. I mean, if you read the beginning of the book of Acts, you would never guess that the apostle Paul would be saved. He was a person who murdered Christians, and, and not only that, but he took pleasure in it. And yet God saved him. There may be people who are in your life who you feel like are, are just hopeless cases. And I want to remind you that they absolutely are not. In fact, I think God loves, I think it's almost a, a part of his sense of humor to, to take those people who seem like they are the furthest away from him and to change their hearts. And when these people are saved, it shows so clearly that the gospel is a work of God and not of people. It's supernatural. It's something that only he can do. But in order for a person to be saved, Paul is saying here, they have to believe that God can do it. And if we are to be effective in carrying the gospel to other people, 
We have to believe that he can do it too. You and I should never give up on anyone because it is the power of God that saves a person. And so Paul asks first, how will they call on him who they've not believed? And the answer is they won't. They have to come to believe first. Now look at what Paul says next. Next, he says, how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? Okay, he's, he's making the next logical argument in this chain of events. And, and this next question follows the project progression. He, he says, if they don't hear the gospel, how can they come to believe the gospel? You, you can't believe something that you've never heard. So in order for them to trust it, someone has to tell them about it. Now, there's an old saying that you've probably heard that goes like this. It, it says, Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. In, in other words, let your lifestyle be so exemplary. Uh, let the, the, the kindness and the, the love in your heart create such an evident picture of the gospel that you never have to say anything to anybody. They they come to faith in Christ by watching you live. And this is a very noble idea in, in many ways. Uh, our example, our lifestyle is critically important, but it, it isn't enough. This passage tells us that words are necessary too. That, that you cannot share the gospel with another person without using words. Because what Paul says is, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? In order for someone to hear, speaking is required. So what Paul is saying is that it's not just enough for us to live our lives hoping that our good example or our thoughtfulness as a neighbor will win people over to Christ. If we don't speak, if we don't tell people what the gospel actually is and means, then they're likely to just assume that being a Christian is the equivalent of being a good example or a thoughtful neighbor. But believing the gospel requires knowing certain truths about Christ and sin and grace and, and forgiveness that cannot be taught just through a person's example. Those things can only be taught by words. I think about this for, for just a minute. We don't separate speech and example in other areas of life. A, a, a driver's ed instructor never throws a 15-year-old in the back seat and just drives them around the neighborhood hoping that they'll figure out what he's doing and, and being able to, to drive a car. Instead, he, he teaches and he instructs and he points out the rules of the road and he tries to answer whatever questions they might have. A, a, a teaching surgeon does not just perform a surgery in front of a student and hope they can figure out what's going on well enough to replicate it later on another patient. She informs them and guides them and, and trains them. And in the same way, our example of what it looks like to live as a Christian is meant to be complemented by our speech of, of what it means to believe this gospel of grace. And, and those two things cannot be separated. Building relationships with people who aren't Christians is a wonderful and important thing to do, and, and seeking to be a, a light in our community is fantastic. But it's important to understand that what Paul says here is that if we really desire that people would come to faith in Christ and believe the gospel, he says eventually they're going to have to hear it with their ears. Because he says, how can they believe in something that they've never heard. Now the third point that Paul is about to make is one that I think really hits home. He says, and how are they to hear 
without someone preaching. Now again, his logic is simple. In order to believe the gospel, a person has to hear the gospel. But if no one tells them what the gospel is, if no one preaches it to them, he says, how will they ever hear it to come to believe it? What he's saying is, is that our willingness to speak the gospel into people's lives is crucial. And yet I think if we're honest, so many of us are so hesitant to do so. I mean, I, I, it's a risky thing to do. It, it takes courage that we often don't feel we have. We are afraid of rejection. We're afraid of saying the wrong thing. We're afraid that we won't have the answers to the questions that we're asked. And there's a hundred of other reasons why we are so often afraid to speak. But I think it's so helpful to look at Paul's uh, attitude towards this. In fact, earlier in the book of Romans, he says these words. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. In other words, the, the thing that gave him the courage to share the gospel was that he remembered that what he was sharing with other people was life itself. I mean, some of us, it, it, it's easy to treat evangelism like we're, we're selling car insurance. You know, we're... We're just not sure that people really want it or that they need it. But Paul, he was convinced of that. He knew that he was offering to people the, the power of God. He was pointing them to this unimaginable gift of kindness and, and grace and, and love. My father, um, he spent most of his career as a salesman. He uh, sold plastics that would be melted down and, and used to build car parts. And one day I, I asked him what the secret was to selling his product. What, what, um, what, did he, what was he thinking about as he tried to sell something to a, a customer? What, what was the secret to being successful? And, and I remember he told me that his secret was that he just really believed that he had the best product. And what he meant was that when he sold his product, he just let the product sell itself. All that he had to do was just show people and, and tell people how great it was. And, and, and his thought was, if, if you have a great product, you don't have to do anything fancy to sell it. You don't have to dress it up or, or worry about having some perfect presentation. You just set it in front of a person and, and let it do its thing. And that's what telling people about Christ is, is like. It's about being personally convinced that what you have in the gospel is, like, like Jesus said, it's, it's like stumbling across a treasure chest that's filled with diamonds and rubies and gold in the middle of the field and, and realizing that it's all been given to you. Realizing that the, the gospel is a gift of unmeasurable value. You know, people speak about the things that we love. We we share the, the places and the experiences and the recipes and the music and, and the activities that, that we love and have benefited from just naturally with other people. And I think sometimes our reluctance to talk about the gospel with others unfortunately comes from not recognizing what it is that we actually have. It, it comes from hearts that have grown cold and indifferent and that takes the things that we've been given for granted. And oh, I want to encourage you and, and I want to encourage myself to pray against this. We need to constantly pray that God would revive our hearts. We need to beg him to guard us against this sort of 
lukewarm thinking and, and living and to invite him to help expand our, our knowledge and our gratitude for who the Lord is and all that he's done. We need his help to make him the priority of our lives and we need to ask him to grow within us hearts that are deeply compassionate for the people who are around us, our, our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our co-workers, so that with a genuine spirit, it would be our greatest joy to throw them the same lifeline that God has thrown to us. And so Paul says here, if nobody tells someone about the gospel, how will they hear? And he says, and if they don't hear, how will they ever come to believe? Oh, that God would, would put a burden for that on our hearts. Oh, that those, those words would, would motivate us and inspire us, not out of guilt, but out of joy. And finally, Paul says, how are they to preach if they're not sent? Now, now this last question is really important. And, and what it tells us is that you and I preach or speak the gospel to other people out of a position of being sent. We are sent by God, and this changes everything. Uh, one of the toys that our kids have is this great big rubber bouncy ball, and they will often, in our basement, uh, bounce around on it. And a day or two ago, I could hear that uh, my youngest daughter, Sarah, was wanting to use this ball, but one of her siblings was using it, and, and she kept asking and asking and asking, but they weren't listening, and she was really beginning to get upset, and I heard her stomp up the basement stairs, and she came into the room that I was in in tears, and she said, they won't let me have a turn with the ball. And, and so I, I said to her, I said, well, Sarah, why don't you do this? Why don't you go downstairs and tell them that Dad said that in five minutes they had to give you the ball. And when I told her that, her entire demeanor changed. Her tears dried up, her frustration all of a sudden turned to confidence because now she had a message to give to her siblings that didn't just originate with herself, but it was a message that was coming from a higher authority, Dad. She was going to go down and speak for me now. And with new strength, she marched down those stairs to claim her bouncy ball in five minutes. Now, when it comes to sharing our faith with other people, we so need to remember that we too are not on our own. You and I are sent by God and we are sent with a message that is not our message. The gospel doesn't originate with us. It's God's message, and we are just like his mail carrier. We don't write the letter. We just deliver it. We just speak the good news that's been told to us by somebody else. And that somebody else is the highest authority of all. It, it is God himself. And we ought to take huge confidence in that. We are not alone. God himself is behind us as we seek to do this. He himself is the one who authorizes us to speak. In fact, he commissions us to speak. We are his ambassadors, the Bible says, sent into the world to proclaim his message. And we ought to take great confidence in this. Now, that, that doesn't mean that's going to be easy. And that doesn't mean that everything's going to go smoothly. And that doesn't mean that it's not still going to require great courage. But my advice is to just be okay with it being hard. Pray for God's Spirit to direct you and to empower you and, and to open doors. And, and just try to have a conversation with somebody. 
look for opportunities to speak about God's love and your own personal need for his grace. Keep the conversation simple. Don't try to be too pushy. In fact, don't be pushy at all. Make sure that you listen to a person first and continue to listen as much as you speak, if not even more. Tell your story. Share what God has done in your life and, and, and don't worry about having all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. Be vulnerable. Be prayerful. Rely on God. Recognize that sometimes those conversations are going to go well and sometimes they won't, but that is not up to you. You are simply the messenger. And I want to conclude by just saying that this passage says one more thing about the messenger. It says that when you carry the gospel to other people, your feet are beautiful. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now this isn't referring to the appearance of your feet. I don't know what your feet look like. But it is referring to what your feet do. Your feet are meant to carry the good news of God's grace into the lives of other people. And in the desperate times that we live in today, people are just dying for good news. God sends you to the best of your ability, depending on his power, to carry that news to him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we read these words that you have written to us this morning, we pray that you would guard us from being indifferent to them. Father, we pray that you would forgive us, first of all, for taking for granted all that you have done for us in Christ. To think that you would send your own son to be crucified on a cross and that through his death we could be given life to the full and hope and certainty in the future. I, I just feel like it's impossible to grasp that, but I want to grasp that more. And I pray for all of us that, that you would grant to us bigger hearts that would be filled with gratitude and, and wonder at all that you have done. And we just confess to you that sometimes our, our, our love and our thankfulness is so shallow. Would you please change that in us? We confess, too, that so often we lack the kind of concern for the spiritual health of the people around us that we ought to have. And so we pray that these words this morning would stir us up to love and, and good deeds towards them. We pray that you would light a fire in our heart for people who are far from you. And we pray that you would give us opportunity with our friends and our family members and our co-workers and our neighbors, not only to be to them a, a, a good example, which we certainly need your help doing, but we pray that you would give us the courage to speak with them, to share with them this good news. We pray for boldness. We pray for wisdom. We pray that we would do so with great joy. And I pray that you would use each person who is a part of our uh, church family and each person who has trusted in you for salvation through Christ. Would you help them to be the feet that carry this news? And would you use them to draw others to Christ? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. darkness your mercy came you called me out lifted me up how great is
Sometimes people have told me that the most uncomfortable point in a worship service is when the basket is passed for the offering. They seem to feel that because it's being done in a public setting, people are watching them to know whether or not they give something. To be honest, that's something I've never felt personally. Uh, giving is between the individual and God, not between the individual 
and any other person, and ultimately that's really what matters. So this week I was thinking that perhaps one small benefit of the shutdown that we've experienced due to the coronavirus is that uh, since we don't have public services, there isn't any plate being passed and people don't have to feel uncomfortable about that. And I just want to thank you so much on behalf of the leadership of the church for showing week after week how you feel the same way, that giving is a responsibility and a privilege that each of us have as believers to support God's work in the community. And uh, we just thank you for responding to that and for living the way that you have. There are really three ways that you can give to the church. The first is to give online through our website. The second is to give by text message. And the third is uh, by snail mail. You can always send a check to the church. And again, we thank you so much for your regular support of God's work at this time. Why don't we pray for the offering this week? Our gracious God, again, we thank you so much that you are the one who, despite adverse circumstances, has showered us with blessings. We pray that you would make us mindful of the ways in which you have blessed us, that you would help us to bless other people who may be struggling at this time, and that you would allow us as a church to continue to expand your kingdom into the lives of other people, even during this time. And so we ask that you would take that which we give this week and you would multiply its effectiveness for your own glory, for our strengthening, and for the fame of the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been about two months since we were able to meet together in person to worship on a Sunday morning. And I remember when we made the difficult decision on a Friday to cancel our in-person services, all of us were scrambling to figure out how we were going to move our services online with only two days advance warning. And that Sunday morning, those who participated in that service uh, stood on the platform with this orange ladder and a laptop computer that we stared into. And quite honestly, nobody was confident that it was going to work. And at the end of the service, we, we all clapped just because we were happy that we were able to pull it off. Well, I'm happy to say today that as we think towards the future about meeting together in person again, we have had plenty of time to prepare. And in a coordinated effort between our elder team and our staff team and our safety and security team and our hospitality team, we've spent time talking with one another and praying together and reading and speaking with other pastors to try to design an in-person service that we feel would really be best for the, the people of our church. And so I am pleased to tell you this morning that on June 7th, Sunday morning, at 11 o'clock a.m., we will offer our first in-person service of the summer, and it's going to happen right here on the church property. It's going to be an outdoor service. And there's three things that you need to know about this service. The first is that it will be designed uh, to be highly organized. Our safety security team and our hospitality team as you arrive at our building, we'll direct you as far as where to park and, and, and where to go. And we will be setting up the property in such a way that people will be able to be distanced from one another and providing uh, an, an opportunity for each person to uh, worship with your family. For those of you who desire to sit outside, you'll be able to bring your own chair and uh, maybe some sunglasses and something to drink and participate that way. For those who would be more comfortable uh, remaining in your vehicle, you'll be able to uh, park here and, and still see the, the stage. And uh, in fact, we're even going to uh, be able to send uh, the sound into your car through your FM radio. So you'll even be able to keep the air conditioning on. 
And, and finally, this will be a service that you will need to pre-register for. We, we don't believe that we would be able to host the entire church at, at one time. So there'll be a process where you can let us know that you're coming and we will be prepared to receive you. Now, all of those details and more will be sent to you this week via the Grace Vine and also through uh, the standard mail. So we hope that when you receive that letter that you'll read all of those details very carefully and feel free to contact us if you have any uh, questions or concerns. We would love to talk with you about that. Well, I know that I speak for so many of you when I say that I am so excited to be uh, together with you in person and we are prayerfully planning that June 7th at 11 o'clock a.m. will be that day. Why don't we pray with one another? Father, we thank you today for the technology that we have that has even uh, allowed this message right here to be communicated to our church. And yet, as we have all experienced the last two months, even though we're grateful for technology, we recognize how limited it is. And uh, we long to be together with one another to worship you. And so we thank you that uh, we have the opportunity to do that uh, soon on, on June 7th. We thank you for the property that you have given us here at the church, this beautiful location that allows us to do that. And we pray that you would not only make that possible for us, but we pray that, that this in-person service this summer would benefit all of us in so many different ways and, and shapes and forms. We ask that you would provide wisdom to those who are planning. We pray that you would um, provide for those who will be working on signage and, and uh, creating a stage and all of the different details that go, that go into this. But we pray that each person who attends would be strengthened from the opportunity to worship you together. And we pray that in the coming weeks that you would be with each uh, person as they need. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.